uh, I'm Matthew Littleton, Kilo November 4, Sierra Whiskey Bravo. I talked about in two weeks ago how I got that call sign and that it's a uh, uh, vanity call from my grandfather. Today, we're going to talk about preparedness, readiness, examples of real world deployments and training, and then we're going to identify some do's and don'ts for the professional communicator. And remember, when I say professional, I'm not talking about being paid. I'm talking about being professional. Volunteer firefighters can be professional and they're not paid. So how do we get here? Found a great little video on YouTube. Uh, the link's here if you want to check it out. So this kind of explains a little bit about who we are. I'm worried about little Dilbert. He's not like other kids. What do you mean? Yesterday, I left him alone for a minute, and he disassembled the TV, our clock, and the stereo. That's perfectly normal. Kids take things apart. Oh! The part that worries me is he used the components to build a ham radio set. Oh, dear. Is that bad? Normally, I'd want to run an EEG on him, but the machine isn't working. It's worse than I feared. What is it? I'm afraid your son has the knack. The knack? The knack. It's a rare condition characterized by an extreme intuition about all things mechanical and electrical and utter social ineptitude. Can he lead a normal life? No. He'll be an engineer. <laughs> There, there. Don't blame yourself. Will it go away over time? It might, but pray it doesn't. If an engineer loses the knack, the results can be devastating. And in further news, you might want to get on those... Thanks for filling in for our regular doctor on such short notice. I was in the neighborhood. I've always enjoyed that, the knack. The uh, gives a little bit about it. But as we get into communication, proper communication, proper messaging is critical. So we've got one more video I want to show you here. This one's kind of kind of a humorous take on making sure we're communicating properly. Again, it's a YouTube video. You can click on the link. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Can you hear us? Can you okay, over? I mean, we are thinking. We are sink. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are thinking. We're thinking. What are you thinking about? So I think we can all agree proper communication is essential. So we've got to put this little disclaimer out here. Uh, I want to talk just a minute about organizational turf wars. Uh, I mentioned this two weeks ago. And one of the things that you see, and it doesn't matter whether it's a club, whether it's an organization, where it's a national entity, whatever it is, for some reason, we feel like that our way is the only way and there's not another method out there. I hate to tell you, I've spent the better part of my career doing communications for public safety and amateur radio. And there's not a one size fits all. I mean, you, you could buy the greatest HF rig there is, and there's still something more that you're going to want. There's still something more you're going to need. You're going to need that last mile tool. You, it's, it doesn't matter what it is. There's always something. And so we need to get away from the labels and we need to get away from my way is the only way. And then you, you hear people all the time say, well, I'm going to do this when the, when the flag goes up, when the disaster hits. But if you're not training for that, you're useless. Just because you went and took a class 10 years ago doesn't mean anything. It's a skill set. It is a skill that you have to hone over time and over multiple hours, multiple trial and error. You can't just take that class and say, I'm good to go. And when it hits, this is what I'm going to do because you're going to be lost. It, you know, there's so much more to it than that. You got to be qualified. I, I mean, that, that is that, that is so important. If you're going to go to a public safety agency or government entity, they don't care how many letters you've got in your call sign. They won't to know that you are qualified for the job that you're trying to do.
And then the last thing I'll tell you on this disclaimer, stop the trash talking. Stop the trash talking. It's whether you're ARRL or your races or your Aries or your Oxcom or whatever it is, stop the trash talking. We got a job to do and we have a need to fill. So we're going to go do it. And tonight we're going to talk about how we're going to do that. Interoperable what? So remember, interoperability starts at Burger King. A big question that I got after the last presentation from folks was, how do you get your emergency manager? How do you get your fire department? How do you get your ham radio club? How do you get, how do you get? It's all boils down to relationships. And the relationships can be solved over the dinner table. If you won't sit down and have a cup of coffee or share a meal with somebody, no amount of, like, the amount of electronics or technology is going to solve that problem for you. You've got to start at the simple way. Yes, Barry, it happens in public safety agencies too. Uh, I, I can tell you countless times in my career where uh, a fire department or a law enforcement agency or an EMS agency didn't get along with the other one. And they really didn't know why they didn't get along. They just didn't like the other one because somebody 50 years ago had a disagreement. So absolutely it happens in public safety agencies too. Start today building, rebuilding your relationships. Um, if you're a part of a, a and I'm, I guess really what I would, would ask you to do is think of your community now. If you're in a community that has a strong professional communicator program, good for you. Teach other people how you did it. Teach other people how you maintain that. What tools, resources do you have that can benefit somebody else? What tools, resources does somebody else have that could benefit your organization? There's no one of us that is as smart as all of us, and not any of us have enough resources to do the job. During the uh, recent Colorado wildfires, uh, Steve could help me remember, uh, good night, I can't remember the guy's name. He's on, on our coffee club sometimes uh, from Colorado. They, they shared an after action from how their MCOM group provided communications to the local authorities having jurisdiction. And he even talked about they didn't have enough personnel to sustain long-term 24-hour operation uh, so it, and that's that's a common thing and, and again this is the same thing for public safety agencies as well uh, you don't have the staffing you need to sustain multi-day long-term uh, operations you got to have help why do we need to get our act together our community needs us plain and simple all, you you take a look around there's all sorts of, of risk and threats that we're facing every day uh, there, there's all sorts of, of natural disasters that take place you name it it's there Emmett Hurdlebrink that's exactly right Emmett Hurdlebrink was the guy from Colorado great uh, after action the, those guys did a great job out there but back to this our community needs us um we need to be ready to go. And, and again, I go back to just because you, you took the class doesn't mean you get a get out of jail free card and you don't get to practice those skills and, until the event happens. We have a unique skill set. One thing that's really, really good about hams is we aren't. Uh, let, let me back up and say this. In the public safety world, we tend to want to try to build radio systems that are almost a one size fits all uh, because the average of the bulk of the users that are using those radios are not uh, radio experts. They like to think they are, but they are not. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to I'm trying to keep up with trying to keep up with the uh, chats here too. I apologize. Yes, Jim, uh, public safety agencies normally operate just above their minimum staffing level. So when something out of the ordinary happens, they are stressed. And it happened, that, that, I think that would be society as all of us. But back to the, uh, what, what you have is we issue a firefighter a radio and we tell him how to change the channels or we tell him how to change the zones. But beyond that, we don't teach him how to do anything. In the grand scheme of things, that's okay because we want that guy to be a firefighter. We want the driver to be a driver. EMS wants the paramedic to be a paramedic. They don't. So one of the things that we started doing here in the Southeast is we've started adopting the field communications model. Uh, we've been training people to field the communications role and specifically the communications role. It's no, in, in that in that capacity, it's no different than if you are a firefighter, paramedic, a sheriff's deputy, whatever the case is, you're, you're becoming a subject matter expert. And that's what we want. Um, so we as hams have a 
very unique skill set and that from day one in our involvement in ham radio we're taught to think outside the box your, your technician class license you start learning wavelengths you learn frequency you learn band plans you learn antennas and if you stay in that that area and you continue your training then you chances are you've probably experimented with experimented with homebrew antennas and so in our group in our com you what we've started doing is utilizing field expedient antennas such as the jungle antenna to help get more range out of it, building simple dipoles things of that nature uh, we, matter of fact uh, last fall we had a had a uh, exercise up in the mountains and working with their national guard partners uh, through the helicopter aquatic rescue team uh, they wanted to they needed to use a, a low band VHF frequency, really, really low. So we quickly wrote out the calculation, figured out how long the each radial needed to be and just hung it, uh, hung a wire dipole from the uh, mast. But the wire, you know, is, is 12 gauge THHN wire and it wouldn't hold straight. So we went and found a piece of wood and just zip tied it to the bottom end of the dipole antenna to keep it straight for a vertical. And, um, see it spurred a whole lot of conversations what's the piece of wood up there at the antenna we come up with every answer under the sun oh that's the vertical stabilizer to make sure the antenna radiates properly <laughs> no it was just weight that was not conductive so it didn't disrupt the antenna but again we have a unique skill set yes barry drill until it becomes multi muscle memory we can think outside the box um if we are dedicated into becoming a professional communicator, we're thinking outside the box. I love simplex because simplex, if I can make simplex work, everything else is gravy. Um, we're not in charge. As professional communicators, we're not in charge. We're there to be a tool. We're there to be a resource. We're there to help the people who are in charge. And, and that's what it boils down to. It doesn't matter. Again, it, I don't care what organization it is. We are not in charge. We're there to provide a service, to provide support. So let's talk about deployment. One of the common things that I hear a lot, when a disaster hits, I'm going to dispatch hams to the affected that disaster area. Well, we call that freelancing. If you don't have a specific mission, a specific tasking, a specific function, then you're freelancing and, and and you think about it what, what is what is that why is that such a big deal uh, i would have difficulty going to colorado and establishing communications between a county eoc and a state eoc in theory that should be easy to do depending upon the, the terrain and things like that but what happens i get out there and the people at the county eoc don't have the capacity to receive the message the state EOC is sending or vice versa. I haven't done a bit of good. You have to have knowledge. You have to have those relationships. You have to, to know how things are set up. Uh, and I heard in, in my state here in South Carolina, there was a, a gentleman several years ago that was mad because uh, the SEOC, our State Emergency Operations Center, was not accepting CW traffic. And the short story of it is that they didn't have anybody staffing the radio room at that time that could do cw so if i was the greatest cw operator in the world it really didn't matter because well nobody hear the message this is something that i think most people forget and, and it doesn't matter what profession you're in if you are a professional communicator and you're you're a a passionate ham radio operator uh, you got to realize that many emergency management authorities today don't know a life outside of technology and, and so it's hard when you go in and talk to them about an emp or a solar flare or whatever it is they they, they, they just glaze over they think this this is a lunatic I, I don't have time to talk to this guy uh, what i would challenge you to do if you're trying to establish your relationship with that EM, I'd look back in your history and see what natural disaster has affected your area. Uh, a jurisdiction I used to work for, our 911 center was taken offline by a thunderstorm that lived for 13 minutes. The cell itself lived for 13 minutes and it took our 911 center offline for uh, five, day, four days. 
four days partially, seven days before fully online. So it doesn't have to be the mega disaster. It's just, hey, look, we've got these tools, these skill sets, and these people that's free to you, that that these guys trained. In, in my home county here in Pickens County, South Carolina, uh, the Emergency Communications Group, WX4PG, WX4Papa de Golf, those guys are doing some, those guys and girls, they're doing some amazing things. They did a uh, simplex a test here a while back and, and they signed people up for a minute slot and they transmit it for a full minute and you were responsible for capturing which stations you could hear on two meter simplex what a great resource to our local emergency management to say hey if we do have a power failure we're prone to ice storms in our area we have a massive power failure we we've got the operations we got simplex operation fairly reliable but the point of it is is Many authorities don't know a life outside of technology. And so the question becomes, are you prepared to bridge the gap to fill the needs for comms? If I ask you what time it is, don't tell them how to build a clock. And then why would you not utilize a program or a service such as WinLink to provide the emergency manager with an email-like experience? That emergency manager, that fire chief, that police chief, they don't care how you send that message. And to kind of keep from that glazed overlook, set the laptop down in front of that emergency manager and say, send an email. Well, the internet's down. No, 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 just, just send the email. Type your email address, I'll take care of the rest. You're gonna get a lot better success out of that emergency manager by something they're familiar with than trying to tell them about all of the widgets and the parts and the pieces. Just set them down and show them how to send an email. And if you're trying to demonstrate it to them, send the email to their email address from your WinLink account. It is, WinLink is an amazing tool. Um, and and I, I, I can tell you from multiple real world deployments, I always have WinLink and specifically our shares account. We always have our shares WinLink station with us. This is just a short list of some of the deployments I've personally been on. Every single one of these has had ham radio involved. Uh, we don't go our honey, we, we call our group the honey badgers. I'll show you our patch in a minute. Um, our group does not deploy without ham radio. Uh, we've got about 50% ham radio operators, 50% public safety folks, and we're trash talking each other, trying to see, you know, encourage each other to get their extra class license and, and keep moving on. So good competition. Uh, and, and all of these, the, the, the couple of things that I really want to point out is Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina was a big turning point in uh, the, the North America with respect to disaster communications. So many organizations had turned to uh, VSAT terminals, very small aperture uh, internet, broadband internet systems. And it's odd because I think at the time we had a, a, a two up, four, four down, two up, something like that, two, megabits. And we thought we were blistering fast in 2005, but you know, and now two by four is, is, is nothing. But, uh, so many people had brought uh, the VSAT terminals to the area that the satellites couldn't handle the traffic throughput. Uh, I had brought uh, my ICOM 706 HF, and that was actually how we had communications wide area from our, our FOB. Uh, 2015 floods we supported uh, with uh, ham radio. Uh, Pinnacle Mountain Fire was a major wildfire we had in the upstate of South Carolina in 2016. Uh, we use crossband technology, uh, crossband operation between VHF, UHF. Now, the U.S. Fire Administration uses that a lot, but it's rare you find public safety communications folks that get the concept of crossbanding. They all want to put up a repeater, but we didn't need a repeater. We just needed a remote base station to get it back to the incident communication center. Uh, so we had hams that were helping us set that stuff up. Hurricane Florence, I've got a picture. Uh, we tried to find a picture of, of this particular setup, but uh, Marion, South Carolina, the uh, local telephone company central office went offline because of the flooding. And uh, so we had sent resources down to USAR and Water Rescue for those folks to be able to communicate, and we lost communications with them. South Carolina ETV owns a trailer that we call the SC Hart trailer. And it has a DMR repeater. It has satellite technology, Wi-Fi. This guy, a great friend of mine, mentor, Gary Leonard. Uh, Gary took that trailer to the Marion Fire Department and set up and was actually having, um, actually having a, uh, uh, providing internet connection and communication with, um, 
I'm sorry, folks. I'm trying to, I'm not good at multitasking, reading these comments. Uh, they actually set up providing internet and communication to the fire department and our resources that we had forward deployed to Marion. I've got a picture of Gary in one of the other trailers. Um, Gary is now the Southeast Sheriff's coordinator. That's correct. John, your how is a crossband different from repeater? In, in actuality, it's not. Uh, crossband, the way we set them up is a bi-directional uh, repeater, for lack of better words. It just, you don't have to tune a duplexer. You don't have to worry about maintaining that. You just take two radios, two antennas, have a little bit of distance between the antennas and they work. So yeah, good question. I think just, we tend to think of a repeater in, as an in-band repeater. <clears throat> so one of the things that I, I talk about are two common forms that that we as professional communicators would send and receive uh, we should all be familiar with the ARRL's radiogram and, and there is a specific place for the radiogram I, I have no heartburn with this but I couldn't imagine handing this to the bulk of emergency managers out there and saying fill this out or sitting down with that stressed out emergency manager and walking through sending it out because the emergency manager chances are has never seen this message they don't care why this radiogram is the way it is and that it helps ensure the message a uh, message accuracy they don't care about that uh, very good tom don't forget to use ctcss on the crossband links absolutely or else you'll eat it up uh, but what you can do is you can use this ICS 213RR for the emergency manager. And most of your public safety officials, especially emergency management are used to the ICS forms. Now, a lot of hams will look at this form and say, man, that is Greek to me, but I'll give you an example. Uh, here a few years ago in South Carolina, we did a, an exercise and we had injects that we provided to different uh, emergency communications groups around the state. And we would say, your emergency manager has asked for a generator for the EOC or a generator for this shelter or the generator for whatever else, you need to send this message to the state. Well, they would send a message to the state that read the Pickens EOC is requesting a generator for the Pickens EOC. The state emergency operations center is going to automatically send that back because it's not enough information to fill that request. You're not telling them how big the generator needs to be, what the capacity is, none of that. You're just telling them, hey, you need a generator, so you're you're causing problems, delays, and errors. Uh, Paul, you are correct. We do not use a single radio for dual band repeat. Uh, we do use two radios. You, the D17 and a lot of amateur rigs can do it, uh, but we use two radios uh, just for the uh, get a little bit better heat sink and a little bit better uh, selectivity out of it. But if a dual band rig is all you got, uh, by all means, use it. But back to the 213. Now, here's the magic part. Mercy manager walks you in, you're staffing the ESF2 position in your EOC. The mercy manager walks in, hands you a written 213RR. You can't really fax it over because if you could fax it, they probably wouldn't need you. But if you do fax, the fax works, please, by all means, fax it. Um, you can take and pull up a form in WinLink and take that information and transcribe it directly into WinLink and send it via email over the WinLink network. And when it gets to the other end, to the state EOC or wherever you're sending it to, they can print that form off. When it comes back to you, you can print it off. And it's great. There's no translation. There's no frustration. It works. But again, these are tools. That, that These are tools that, that you should be familiar with. So I thought I'd put some pictures in. Um, the only picture I had, in, and unfortunately, in the deployments I've been on, it tends to get busy and you don't have a whole lot of time for pictures of the good stuff. Uh, this is uh, the Marion FOB that we set up. And again, Gary Leonard, my friend, uh, was not far from here providing internet and uh, stuff to the first net cow or colt, sack colt got there. Uh, they uh, did a great thing. Uh, this is a good example of a, of a public safety partnership. This is a training exercise. The antenna at the top of the ladder truck is a two meter diamond antenna. Uh, they were conducting a simplex exercise. These were not public safety personnel that were using this antenna. They were, they were all hams. But here's the cool thing is after a little bit of time, you if you didn't know who was who or the uniforms were different, 
you wouldn't know that one was a ham and one was a public safety. It, they, they, were, they were very much doing the same job. That's where the professional communicating comes down the road. And so this was simulating a major storm and got to the fire chief and says, hey, can we use your ladder truck to elevate an antenna? So ladder truck, this particular one was 95 feet. They elevated the antenna 95 feet. The driver was happy. The officer was happy. Put it up. Guess what? They're communicating from inside the shelter. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm using acronyms. Um, what is a so-called FOB, forward operating base? Uh, a lot of times, uh, a lot of times uh, when we go to a disaster area, we set up a forward operating base that uh, kind of has an area of responsibility. So we take communications, we take uh, extra equipment. It's, it's a staging area, for lack of better words, for a giving area of operation. Um, Yes, FOB is a military term. Uh, it's also a public safety term. I guess probably in the ICS world, it's a base camp um, it would be a better scenario. Uh, yes, Tom, sending your wind link message to the emergency manager cell phone is very impressive. Um, let's see. Yep, you're absolutely right, Don. I learned a lot from uh, Katrina. That was a uh, that was a tough deployment, but it, we we learned a lot, and who we are as South Carolina Task Force One was uh, is is very much shaped by that deployment. Uh, take a look at the chat if you're not. Uh, Steve just posted the short uh, or the email addresses where you can send to cell phone providers. But moving right along, here's a picture. The only picture I had of Gary Leonard. Uh, doing what Gary does. This is the, if I'm not mistaken, this is the Aiken County Emergency Services Emergency Communications Trailer that is staffed by ham radio operators. Uh, it's got a while, you'll notice there's public safety radios, there's ham radios, there's, and, and that's what, the more you're involved, the more of these relationships you build, the more you're going to see uh, public safety officials re relaxing some of the reins on being able to have because at the end of the day is get the message through that that's what we need uh but but gary's is, is a great guy uh, he roger mole gabe turner uh several other folks in south carolina are really rock stars in the ham radio world again keep an eye on the chat there's some really good information coming great information there paul on your already in uh the pots line uh, adapter so put our pot patch up here. Um, our commu consisting of professional communicator. This is our patch um, that we have. And uh, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of stuff that's moving around here. Uh, you've got the Maltese Cross because we're part of the South Carolina State Fire Marshals Organization. Um, the Emergency Response Task Force is home or the parent of South Carolina Task Force One's Urban Search and Rescue. Uh, the Honey Badgers, when we started putting the uh, rebuilding the comm you to, to make it what we need we we would have a need and we would go out and magically be able to fill these needs uh we had people in relationships that would that that hey we we're, we're getting rid of this piece of equipment uh, can you guys use it yes we can use it and uh so uh, and keeping the morale up and, and everything there's a video that i won't share here just because it's not very family friendly uh but it's about the honey badger narrated by randall really great uh, it's, it's just it kind of gives you an idea the honey badger we, we take what we want um the lightning bolt represents the signal uh core in the in, in the army and i never have understood why lightning bolts represent communications because you know in, in my world lightning bolts are not very good for communications but it is their uh, it is representation you've got the tower and then you got a catfish down here in the lower left along with a black hawk helicopter at the top uh, one of the things that we do in our commu is uh, we are hoist qualified meaning that part of the helicopter aquatic rescue team mission if we go to a disaster area we are trained and qualified to be lowered by hoist to establish communications with the disaster area and start affecting recovery response and recovery and then of course the honey badgers really proud of the folks that are on there again it's a mix and match of of uh, hams and public safety folks doing all this uh, this is a picture from insider field com one uh, from hurricane florence 
um, you really can't see a, a lot of good stuff in this picture. And, and I'm sorry, I just, I don't have a lot of uh, pictures from our deployment, but there are, uh, yeah, if you kind of look up to the left, that's our ham radio and our aviation radio uh, rack. Uh, we've got, it's the shares radio for Windlink, and then the, the Panasonic tough book, uh, just right about right. Just the second peak laptop on the left is our shares, um, uh, wind link station. The first laptop, somebody mentioned in a chat, Web EOC. Uh, South Carolina has something a little bit different than Web EOC. We have the Palmetto uh, COP common operating picture. It translates it as an API to Web EOC, but we don't directly use Web EOC uh, in the field. Absolutely, Edwin. Absolutely. Look, look forward to it. But I, I, Edwin, I think uh, getting here. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. We, we're always we're always about that. And same here. Uh, this is a picture of the Aiken County Emergency uh, Communications trailer. It's all emergency communications. This was at uh, actually staffed and positioned at the South Carolina Emergency Operations Center. Let's talk about some do's and don'ts of the professional communicator. And I'm gonna have to move my screen out of the way here so I can read them as we go through. Do respond according to existing policies and procedures. Don't freelance. Don't buy into the, the, the organization says, I'm, I'm gonna send hams to the disaster area and they're gonna do ham stuff. Look, go train. Go, go train, build those relationships so that when you get there, you, you know what's going on. Don't be that guy. Uh, when I taught this, I, I taught a similar program at our state uh, at our state emergency communications training a couple of years ago before uh, COVID hit. And real good friend of mine, John Carter. Uh, John is a public safety communications guy and a ham, an accomplished ham. And I asked John, I said, John, I want you to be the obnoxious ham that walks into the EOC with the two meter four, four, whatever, just, just, just be that obnoxious guy. We all know that one. And uh, so we're out in the middle of the conversation. John's got this traffic vest on. He's got his cert helmet on. He's got his radio tuned to the weather, uh, NOAA broadcast. And I mean, it just was the most, I, I, I was taken aback because I knew it was coming. It was still just like, golly, boom, this is a, like, but when you go in, check in, do what you're supposed to do. And, and you know what? Sometimes, the need is not to run a radio. Sometimes the need may be to run a copier. Well, if that EOC manager needs you to run a copier, be the best copier that there's ever been. If, if that EOC operator needs you to, to uh, be a scribe or, or track the ICS 214, be the best that's ever been. Do be self-sufficient. You shouldn't need anything from the host agency. Let's see. Let me catch up on some more. Yes, absolutely, Barry. We should be a part of a cohesive team where every specialty is treated the same. You know, it's it, it's funny. I think about that a lot. That uh, if if every one of us were identical, we would be a very boring culture. Um, and in in public safety and communications and in the business world, there's no one person that's that is going to be able to do every job and do it well um, I, i've been in i've been in, in public safety for 28 years and if we have a hazmat incident today there's a handful of people i'm going to call because hazmat is not my strong suit uh, if we get into a technical rescue i'm going to there's a handful of people i'm going to call that's not my strong suit uh, i'm qualified but it's not my strong suit i'm going to go find the experts but be self-sufficient that's one thing that's really really important um, we always go prepared for ourselves uh, we take everything we need with us and, and you should do the same thing uh, don't ever show up to eoc and ask when's lunch don't trash talk and what I mean by trash talk, don't trash talk the, the county's radio system or the county's EOC or the tower or the coverage inside the building or other clubs or organizations. You're there for a job. And part of being a professional is sometimes keeping our mouth shut. Do know of alternate communications path and systems. This is so important. So many times, uh, and we talked about this the last two weeks ago, we talked about how that if you are the ham that lives to, to spin the dial every night of the week and check into the weekly nets, 
great. There's nothing wrong with that. Ham radio is a hobby. And if you get enjoyment out of that, by all means, do that. But when you're going to be in emergency communications, you can't be the ham that only knows of the one repeater that you talk on for the net and, and that's it you got to know the extra stuff you got to know how to put the, the radio in simplex mode you got to know how to, to program frequencies on the fly uh, there's a lot more to it than just do not use ham jargon and do not rag to you if you're given the job as a radio operator radio operator or radio be short keep it simple student stupid when you're talking to your emergency management professionals don't use ham radio jargon. Uh, I mean, I couldn't. Could you imagine going to an emergency manager that's not familiar with ham radio and saying, yeah, we were rag chewing the other night. They're, they're going to look at you. You were what? You know, uh, it's when you talk about cross band and duplexers and stuff like that, that they don't, they, they're probably not going to know. No jargon, period, no matter what radio you use. Absolutely. Do use utilize tactical call signs. We talked about this two weeks ago. Get familiar with tactical call signs. Uh, do comply with the FCC rules. Uh, that's that's very very important. Uh, and this is something that we that I've seen a lot of in my days. Don't program your non type accepted radio with public safety channels. Matter of fact, if you don't have permission to have public safety radio. Uh, 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 channels and frequencies programmed in your radio don't have them don't even have them if you're going into an eoc you're not you don't have a relationship with don't even have them programmed as receive only just you know i know people are going to argue with me on that but it, if you don't have an established relationship the first thing somebody's going to say is what's he doing with that radio they don't know it, it, it they, they don't understand they don't get it just, just don't do that. Be a good guest. Remember, you're a guest providing a service and, and you're going to do something for these folks. You're going to help them out in a time of need. Do not assume you can access a particular channel. Just because you're in the radio room and you're, you're running the, whatever your assignment is doesn't mean that you have access to every radio channel in there. Don't assume. Do coordinate with the COML. The COML is the communications unit leader. And if you're working under an incident management system, you are one of two things as a ham radio, or one of multiple things, only if you're qualified, though. But if you're qualified at OXCOM, you're qualified RADO, qualified INTD, uh, whatever that case is, you, you are... You, you're going to coordinate with that COMEL. Uh, if you're not qualified as one of those, you could be considered a tech specialist. And what do I mean by qualified? You've taken the these you've taken the respective course, you've finished your uh, position task book, and you're recognized by the authority, whether it's your state or a federal agency. Yep, very much so, Tom. What can we do to be a service? Well. God gave us two ears and one mouth. That must mean he wants us to listen twice as much as we talk. Listen, listen, listen. When you get, I should have talked about this, gathering intelligence, just listen. Listen to the other radio channels. Uh, one of the things that I did during Hurricane Florence, or our team did, was we actually watched the Palmetto EOC uh, when we would see real-time information coming from the the local EOCs in the affected areas about flooding or people trapped or something like that. And we would relay that information to our decision makers. Now that was part of our job. We wasn't snooping. That was, we were part of the intelligence section. It kind of gave us a heads up situational awareness to be able to, we did not post that information on social media. Very, very important. Or we didn't put that information out over radio channels. Again, do not share information with the EOC unless it's been authorized. Be prepared to perform even the lowest and menial of tasks. Be have a servant's heart when it comes to uh, doing this to, to deployment opportunities. Here's some good sources of information: social media. Uh, if social media is allowed in there, there's nothing wrong with monitoring social media. Just don't be posting. I would discourage you if you don't have a good relationship with your served agency from being on social media, because all it takes is somebody to see you scanning that social media site. And then look, look, look at old Oscar. Oscar was over there posting on Facebook and, 
Oscar wasn't posting. He was looking for pictures and video of what's going on in the damage area. So, you know, the, the relationships piece is, is, is critical. Internal, external, your NIFOG and your OXFOG, uh, both of those are public information. Great tools, uh, print them out and, and take them with you. So why is all this important? Well, when a disaster hits, we're expected to perform at a professional level. We need to know how to send traffic and who to send it to. Remember my example of going to Colorado. If I, if, if I were to go to Colorado to, to help Emmett, uh, I don't have a clue how their county EOC and their state EOC interact with each other in alternate communication forms. I don't have a clue. So it would be foolish for me to just go there and demand that they do it my way. I need to know that. We need to be self-sufficient sufficient, and our community needs us. So with that said, I will entertain any questions and uh, comments. I've tried to keep up with the chat as best I could. Does anybody have any questions, comments, hate mail? You want to throw some rocks, whatever. Hayden, go, let's see. I don't know. You should be able to unmute yourself, Hayden. Yeah, that's that. That's a push to talk. Um, first of all, uh, I w wanted to, you know, when I first got into ham radio, my mentor, uh, who is a big DXer, uh, lived in Jakarta for thirty years, and he was all into uh, uh, DXing. And he told me, uh, stay away from the nets. Well, in the years that have gone, and he's he's already. A silent key. I've uh, learned that actually getting on the nets and participating uh, actually gets you to learn how your equipment works and keep practicing it. And I encourage people to uh, take a turn at being net control because you get the opportunity to uh, try and write things down, talk things out, and uh, be correct in what you're communicating. And I think that's a good thing. Also, uh, I find that it, especially for HF nets, uh, headphones is a very important thing because you can block out the noises around you and uh, pick up those uh, lighter stations that you're trying to hear. Uh, and also, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, your, uh, what are you thinking? Uh, that cracked me up because I have three three videos that I share with people for entertainment, and that's one of them. Anyway, back to you. Question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll come right along. Tom, go ahead. You had your hand raised. Yes, sir. One tip, and uh, please don't ask me how I know this. It's too embarrassing. Do not incorporate an internally accessed toilet into any vehicle you build for uh, MCOM use. You are absolutely Put right. Put the yes. door to the toilet on the outside if you have one at all. Absolutely. Before I get to Larry here, one of the questions I had in the chat, can you expand on field communications model? So in the public safety world, uh, we, we, we follow the incident management system and, and the field communications is, well, really field communications is not part of the incident management system. It's something we've kind of adopted. Basically what we're doing is we're taking the role of the dispatcher and putting them in the field. Now in the ham radio world, we're calling it the, the net control station, uh, but we're putting that in the field and dedicating it to the incident. The incident management uh, world, uh, world, it's called an incident communication center uh, more often than not. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. I'll lower my desktop. Okay. I'm sorry. I was trying to keep my, I was trying to keep my, um, trying to keep my name and email address up here. Okay, so going right along. Larry, you had your hand next. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, yep, I got you. Go <laughs> ahead. Yeah, one of the things that uh, you didn't bring up when you were talking about the communications is um, out here, I try to impress with my operators. First of all, you don't rebroadcast something that's being sent over 
whatever public channel, i.e. local broadcasting, one. And number two, we don't try to pass on uh, information off of social media as fact. Just because you're the ham operator, a lot of people think, well, they really know what's going on when they're actually just repeating some diatribe that may be 100% false. Absolutely. Thank you for the comments. John, go ahead. Uh, in your organization, do you all do resource typing of the people who are not public safety officers? Yes, we do. Now, it does bring up a challenge uh, when it comes to reimbursement. FEMA does not have a model to reimburse uh, volunteers, but however, we do resource into either single resource or more often than not, we're uh, working as a strike team or a task force. Good question. Brett? Yeah, good evening, Matthew. That was, nice. that was a good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick question for you. Uh, I have two radios that I carry with me that are not programmed, but they are programmable. And one fellow said to me, if you bring those down to, and we have an exercise, he said, I'll definitely program those for you instantly right off my laptop. So you have all your all the repeaters that we're going to be using uh, at the scene. Is that uh, do you fellows uh, use that sort of situation too? Like if somebody oh, absolutely. So, so one of the things that we do is uh, we try not to program radios or reprogram radios in the middle of an operational period. So most EOCs, most organizations in the public safety world operate on a 12 hour operational period schedule. Most are 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. So whatever we're doing to, for, at this moment is for the next operational period. Uh, a good form for you to get familiar with is the ICS 205. It's the communications uh, plan and it lists all of the, the channels, frequencies, PL tones, modes, NACs, so on and so forth for the incident. And the COMEL, the communications agent leader and the COMT, the communications technician are going to work off of that 205. So uh, we typically roll out with a standard set in state if we're going out of state, uh, we, that's a different animal altogether. Uh, we work through our state's ESF2 to coordinate with the state where we're going's ESF2 to find out where we need to be and operate. And more often than not, we're doing all of that change on the way. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. Yes, sir. Any other questions? You might say a little bit about your uh, fire task force, your out of state work with fire task force so south carolina has an urban search and rescue team south carolina task force one it's a state team uh, in the federal system there's 28 federal teams that are type one usar urban search and rescue um, south carolina's uh, our, our program we are an all hazards program uh, we don't do just usar we do water rescue we do horror we do we have the palmetto incident support team uh, with a little bit of everything that goes on but every team that goes out uh, either takes a part of or all of the COMU, uh, our communications unit uh, that goes with it. And we support primarily our organization, but we have on many occasions supported the local jurisdiction when we've arrived because they've been overwhelmed. And, and you know, in South Carolina, we've received that, that same support. Uh, one of the things that, that we really enjoy doing is working with our National Guard partners with the signal units and with our aviation brigades and battalions. Uh, one thing I do want to mention in South Carolina we've got going well is we've got the SC Heart system. Uh, if you want to look it up, look up uh, www.scheart.us, -E uh, scheart.us. There's some, uh, the... Uh, Late John Crockett was the, the one of the masterminds behind it. Uh, he, Roger Mole, and Steve Davis, uh, those guys uh, really were looking for a way to get uh, uh, DMR. Well, it started for DMR. It started with uh, VHF and our uh, two meter four forty network statewide, and we've now got a statewide DMR four forty network that's connected using the sea bridge uh, that we can use in disasters. Uh, and it, the the ETV on sites ride our ETV state. ETV microwave backbone. They don't touch the internet. So lots of redundancy and reliability there. Um, check that out. Some really good stuff. Uh, again, they were, they're great supporters of us. Uh, Paul, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Someone earlier said when you get there, the first thing you don't, you do is uh, don't say, you know, like when's lunch kind of thing. But yeah. I know I've worked in the healthcare field 
as uh, an agency person. And where I work now, we have travelers come in. And it actually is important to know when you're supposed to show up, what location you need to be, where is the nearest bathroom, and when is it okay to take a break or lunch, and how long you were there. Sometimes we have a person come from another unit because they've been excessed, and my shift might be over at 7.30, but I'll usually ask the extra person, when do you typically get off? They might only be there till 5.30, so it avoids miscommunication to have that stuff clear, because when you got to go, you got to go. Oh, no two ways about it. I guess the point of it is, is, you know, it's real easy to show up, but when you show up to somebody that is, um, if you show up to an organization that needs your help, be a help and not a burden, uh, make sure that you're self-sufficient. There's nothing wrong with getting, you should absolutely receive a safety briefing. You should absolutely receive a familiarization briefing. Uh, you should know your task, what's expected. Those things are, are very reasonable to, to expect, but just be a help and not a burden. Any great questions, great feedback. I've really enjoyed this. Uh, um, any other questions that uh, you may have or, or comments? Yes, Oscar. Thank you, Matthew. Excellent presentation, actually. You just made me remember Maria and all the uh, yeah. emergency communications down here in Puerto Rico. You just mentioned something that I believe is extremely important, and we should make a presentation at some point about the task book and explain everybody how to fill it up, who have to sign it, and how you can accomplish those uh, building blocks, those tools that allow you to be a better operator and, and much better responder. Absolutely, Oscar. That is, uh, we in the public safety world, we live and breathe by the position task books. And, and you know, it's, it, that's, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? I do have a question. Could yes, you explain, I, and I think you know the answer and I know the answer, but I'm not sure if anybody else does. The difference between a first responder and a professional communicator. Well, there's, it really gets into semantics. The first responder could very well be the professional communicator, but typically your first responder are the guys that are arriving on the ground first do. Uh, you, you know, we have a joke in the fire service. Uh, everybody wants to be first due. Everybody wants to be the guy, the girl that gets there first. Uh, and I used to joke about, I was going to put a sticker in the rear view mirror on the fire truck when I was riding the seat that said objects and mirror second due. Uh, so it's a little bit of good, you know, healthy bantering out and back. But the professional communicator, when I think of the professional communicator, they're the, they're the folks that are coming in to for that next operational period. The folks that are coming in to provide that support that are coming in to, to backfill, for lack of better words. Yep, that's that's correct. And we need to we need to take that into consideration. We are not first responders usually, un unless you are in a fire company or your police department and you're doing that role, but usually you're not going to be doing the communications role if you're going to be first due with a fire. That's going to be done by people who come back later. And in, in a lot of cases, yeah. Now, I will tell you, uh, in 2020, February of 2020, we had uh, we uh, we had an unusual event occur in Pickens County. We had a, f a flood event that was, uh, we had a, a storm system that dumped way more rain was forecast. And so we, and, and the emergency management, none of us were expecting this event. And uh, so I got up early that morning, to drink, you know, like I always do, was drinking my coffee and I'm listening to um, our local two meter uh, net and uh, some of the hams are, the, uh, are providing information. I start listening, they're talking about flooded out roads. And I thought, man, what are they talking about flooded out roads? So I called the emergency manager. I said, hey, do you know that we've got flooded out roads in this area? And she says, no, there's no, there's no flooded out roads. And, and I said, listen to this. And, and so our hams as part of our emergency communications group were the first to provide the, the information. So in some respects, you can be a first responder, which is probably the reason why I say we need to be trained and qualified. Uh, yes, John, go ahead. It sounds like the honey badgers are uh, prepared to travel and have like statewide responsibility. Are there more local organizations that you all coordinate with, you know, like county or city level? 
Absolutely. Uh, we we often joke about it. And there's a couple of our, our, our my team members that are on here tonight. We, we joke about being mercenary communicators. Uh, we, we absolutely love going to other places and helping. Um, in South Carolina, there's 46 counties and, and every county has an emergency operations center, an emergency manager. Um, all of us are not full time at the state level. We are on loan by our organizations. And so my job full time is with the city of Easley in South Carolina as the fire chief. So uh, we, we actually go and help the other first responder organizations probably more often than we do at the state and uh, deployment level. Is there a system for mutual aid? Yes. Uh, so South Carolina. Uh, so in state, we have firefighter mobilization. We have the statewide mutual aid agreement. And then, of course, the emergency managers can do that uh, in trust or in, interstate. Um, we have uh, EMAC requests that we also are available to deploy upon as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Dan? Yeah, I was duty stationed in five different states with the National Park Service, and I believe it's the same in all of them, that first responders have a, a scope of practice or general orders that they have to adhere to. Volunteers, as but when you're acting as a volunteer what you have to do is listen to what the folks that have those standards tell you to do um i i i just sort of bounced when you said that uh volunteers are or oxcom well i guess oxcom would qualify as having Ox the same standards absolutely as as the ema they're working for Absolutely. So that's probably one of the things that, that I think you hear a lot of people. I, I, you always hear the rumor, Oxcom is taking over. Oxcom is trying to do it. Oxcom is a qualification. That's all it is. You can be red carded for what well, you I don't know if you can do it in the U.S. Forest Service, but you can you can be red carded for Oxcom because it is a qualification through NQS. Yeah, and actually red carded is national. That's correct. If I'm not mistaken. OK, well, thanks. Yeah, as always, you know, you're. You, you lay it out like it is, and that's invaluable. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm trying to catch up here with the comments. Again, there's lots and lots of good, uh, lots of good information here in the comments. Well, Steve's got his hand up. Oh, I didn't see that. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, I just uh, want to make a statement uh, that um, hams are great at. Uh, providing ground truth uh, and providing input uh, as a first response, whether it be Skywarn uh, representing their county or an in, as an individual. Um, sometimes they're even uh, useful if they're not really uh, involved in the actual incident. They could come on with, uh, with ground truth inf information that can be used by uh, an authority having jurisdiction, and that is the where I would put in quotes hams being first responders, providing ground truth uh, in flooded areas or areas that uh, uh, the uh, professional EMA can't really get to, outer bank type, uh, just anywhere. Yep. Thank you, Steve. Dan. Yeah, this is kind of a response to Steve. Um, what convinced me that WinLink was worth paying a lot of attention to was when I saw the IWARN form that I'm not sure, you know, which jurisdiction asked for it, but basically it was just a form that your scribe could take notes as you uh, drove through an area about the conditions you were seeing. And um, that really struck me as, okay, this is going someplace. You know, sometimes on certain parts, other parts of the country, that's covered by a lot of formal uh, processes, but in other parts of the country, like where you are, it isn't. So you're right, you're 100%. Well, folks, we're coming up on the 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 hour here and uh, i don't like long lectures i apologize for making it long but there was some a lot of information i wanted to get out to you if you take nothing else away from me tonight please 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 work on building and rebuilding relationships between your organization and your local served agencies there's there's nothing can be more important than that uh, and then 
make sure that you're doing your part to be trained, qualified, and ready in whatever role you want to feel. If, if again, if if you're happy being a ham that spins the dial, checking in the nets, great, man, rock on. That's awesome. That's what. But if you have a heart for emergency communications, you know, raise the bar, get some training, get some experience, and practice those skill sets. Um, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, please reach out. And for those of you who are going to watch this on YouTube later, uh, please uh, reach out. We're glad to talk and help. Dan, back to you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Oops, I better put my hat, hair, hair hat back on. <laughs> oh, okay. One thing you turn your camera off. Uh, but never mind. I'm going to go. This has been a great presentation. A lot of good uh, points uh, and questions. Barry's got his hand up. Go ahead, Barry. No, I'm just clapping. Oh, okay. That's hard sometimes to tell the difference. Okay, so with that in mind, unless we have some more comments or questions, do we? Looking for thank, to... thank you so much, Matthew. That was a great presentation. It was very much so. Very well put and uh, very much uh, to the point. Appreciate that. Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to close this out. Wish everybody best of 73s, and I'll see you the next go around.